headquarters of Talisur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is From the South. I am Doris Polo. On Tuesday night, Brazil was rocked by a bombshell revelation that allegedly links the country's far-right president to the murder of Rio Councilwoman Marie Franco. According to media giant Rede Globo, one of the men responsible for Franco's murder visited the private complex where the then deputy lived hours before committing the crime. He also registered as a visitor for Jair Bolsonaro, who was in Brasilia at the time. The guard on duty has confirmed that someone inside Bolsonaro's apartment authorized the entry of Elicio Quiroz to the complex. Quiroz then headed to Ronnie Lesa's home, which is inside the same complex. Lesa is the man accused of firing the weapon that killed Marie Franco and her driver, Anderson Gomez, while Quiroz drove the vehicle used for the murder. Now, even though Lesa and Quiroz have already been charged with Franco's murder, many have continued to question who were the real authors of the crime. Soon after the revelations were made public, the far-right president lashed out on social media at the reports. In the video, Bolsonaro shouts and threatens Brazilian media, coming close to tears as he proclaims, this will not stick, and claiming that Rede Globo is persecuting him. A number of Brazilian lawmakers have announced they will call for an emergency meeting with the Supreme Court's president to look into the allegations. Chileans took to the streets once again on Tuesday, pouring by the thousands into plazas and shutting down main boulevards in a sign that government promises of reform continue to fall short. Our correspondent Alejandro Kirk has the latest from Santiago. Uh, it's been a tough day in Santiago today. Again, a big demonstration of health workers and supporters try to reach La Moneda, the presidential palace, to deliver the same message they have been trying to deliver uh, for now 12 days, which is constitutional assembly and um, a new government, resignation of President Piñera. The list of uh, grievances is so long that it's difficult to say. I would say that not l less than 100,000 people were today on the streets protesting and they were really uh, brutally attacked by the police, brutally because we were there. Uh, we saw at least 10 people injured by rubber bullets. One of them was uh, an official of the National Institute of Human Rights who was taken to hospital. It has six bullets in his body and we saw the, the, these uh, cops uh, firing at random. Uh, uh, the, the, the denunciation has been that they should um, straight to the faces of people. More than uh, 150 people have severe eyes injuries which confirm what we uh, have been seeing on the streets all this time. Tomorrow there is a national strike. Tomorrow is supposed to be a turning point in this struggle. Uh, people expect that the government at, at last will hear the message. The message of uh, the, uh, fundamental change in this country. It is not. Uh, it has been 30 years of neoliberalism, which this uh, the population is fighting. It's almost uh, you know a consensus. Uh, this is very. Well, the, what these people are saying is the same message we have been hearing. We have been, we have been hearing all week. Piñera, they say, is an, uh, a murderer. Piñera has been killing people, that people are disappearing, that people are being tortured. That's a message we get. People are desperate to Piñera deliver their killer. message. Cambia la constitución. Piñera killer, cambia la constitución. Uh, Piñera killer, change the constitution. That's a message. It's difficult to say more than what we have heard.
here right now. This is every day we get the same situation. We start speaking and people feel that they need to deliver their message, to be heard by somebody. The local press is not listening. The international press is not listening. It seems only Telesur and some other outlets are uh, reporting this. Um, this is my report for today. That was our correspondent Alejandro Kirk bringing us that report from Chile. In Colombia, three indigenous guards and a social leader have been murdered in the department of Cauca. A local indigenous organization denounced the murders and provided details of the events. In a communique, the Association of Indigenous Counties of Toribio, Taqueo, and San Francisco said that a black car pulled up and heavily armed assailants opened fire. Six other people were injured in the attack. The Colombian Senator Gustavo Bolivar tweeted to call on President Ivan Duque to act. He said, it's a black day. Killings continue. This morning, two leaders murdered at midday a former combatant, and now they're reporting four indigenous guards and a leader. Eight deaths in one day. You have to act, Ivan Duque. Staying in Colombia, regional elections were held on Sunday and the right-wing ruling party was dealt a number of humiliating defeats. We talked with Margarita Bataille from London on the implications of these outcomes. Here's what she had to say. I don't think the results were totally unexpected. Actually, this was something that has already been happening. The president has had some defeats, congressional defeats, I would say, in terms of trying to pass laws that were um that did not get passed um so he's getting a bit weaker every day this was uh definitely not uh not something completely new all the candidates that won are candidates that will be able to to help build bridges bridges that are more effective for for dialogue and and that is something you know that has to be said but we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't deny the fact that a lot of social leaders were killed before the election, a lot of candidates, and those are things that are still there and that, you know, that the government need, needs to acknowledge, needs to, to, to deal with. Uh, they haven't dealt with it. So I'm assuming this slight change in terms of ideological, you know, more important parties and candidates is going to have an effect. Judges from the Peruvian Constitutional Court have voted unanimously to challenge President Martin Vizcarra's decision to dissolve Congress. Opposition lawmakers brought a legal case against President Vizcarra on Tuesday, contending that he broke the law when dissolving the legislature, triggering a constitutional crisis. Various groups have protested against the measure outside the Constitutional Court. Competency claim for processing is allowed, and the executive power will be notified so that the questions are answered in accordance with the Vizcarra's right to a defense in the corresponding time. Shifting gears now, Bolivia's Vice President Alvaro Garcia Linera has invited the opposition candidate Carlos Mesa, who lost to President Evo Morales, to join an international audit by the Organization of American States to clear up any doubts about the election result. Carlos Mesa has started a campaign of aggression and of burning institutions, the burning of ballot boxes, and even a campaign against the popular vote itself. The best way to clarify doubts, the doubts that some had about the result of October 20, is to perform an audit of the official vote count that determines whether the alleged fraud exists or not. Coming up, Venezuela and Russia to tighten relations in the oil sector. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. 
Venezuela's National Constituent Assembly has approved an agreement to deepen ties with Russia. The deal seeks to establish a greater relationship between both countries' oil companies, PDVSA and Rosneft, following the illegal sanctions imposed against Venezuela by the United States. President of the Assembly, Diosdado Cabello, applauded Russia's support for the Latin American country as it stands firm against the international blockades. The Russian Federation has been one of the main passion of resistance. They have made every effort to do what's necessary regardless of these sanctions, supporting the people of Venezuela. We were there and the president of the Russian Duma told us they will support us with whatever is necessary for Venezuela. Constituents who agree to approve this proposal do so with the usual sign, approve. In other news. Public assistance will increase by $25 for the poor and elderly in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So said Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, who was speaking at a land distribution ceremony as general elections are constitutionally due by March 2021. You know, yesterday I announced at Victoria Park that from January, public assistance going up by $25. So those who are over 65 who get in 250, they're going to get 275. And those who are under 250 who are under 65 and who get 225 going to get 250. Let me tell you this. I will go to all the lengths to take care of the old and the poor in this country. And anybody who don't like it, they could always vote against me. Staying in the Caribbean, Barbados foreign reserves have increased to over 595 million US dollars at the end of September 2019. This is up from 322.5 million US dollars back in October 2018. The central bank, in its latest report, explains that this was due to lower external debt payments and a second dispersal of funds from the IMF. In the last budget, the Mia Motley administration announced that it will loosen its grip on nearly five decades of foreign exchange controls. As a result, Barbadians can now open foreign currency-denominated bank accounts to hold money they have earned at home or abroad. Antigua and Barbuda's Prime Minister Gaston Brown has called for togetherness and respect leading up to Independence Day on Friday, November 1st. Speaking on National Heroes Day on Monday, the Prime Minister focused on the importance of unification as he pleaded with members of the public not to mobilize. To build a truly united Antigua and Barbuda. And we know that there will always be political differences. But political differences should not cause us to tear down our country. Political differences should not cause us to disrespect our independence. And I call upon those who call themselves faithful nationals to respect our country's independence. In Somalia, flash floods have killed at least five people in the capital Mogadishu. More than 180,000 have been forced to flee their homes due to the flooding. Rescue teams are continuing to search for bodies following reports of more missing people. Meanwhile, on Monday, another 10 people died when a rescue boat capsized in the central town of Beldweni. Members of a Kenyan community that was violently displaced to make way for British-owned tea plantations in 1934 are demanding reparations from the British government. The community was lamented, or lamented rather, that decades after their country gained independence, they are still unable to return to their land as it remains in the hands of multinational corporations such as Unilever who use it to produce cash crops. The violent expulsion of black people from fertile farmland was widespread across Africa Africa during colonialism. Oh, who are chased away from this soil is the Kipsiki community. And actually the shareholders, the current shareholders who are in Britain are reaping uh, profits out of uh, the proceeds which is planted on our soil. Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri 
says his country is willing to participate in internationally mediated talks with Ethiopia over a dam the latter is constructing on the Nile River. Shukri told visiting German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas that Cairo is committed to finding an amicable solution to the dispute with Addis Ababa. The two nations have been at loggerheads for more than a decade over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Egypt says the project, located near Ethiopia's border with Sudan, will drastically reduce the flow of the Nile, on which it depends for around 90% of its water supply. Ethiopia, on the other hand, insists that it needs the dam to generate electricity to meet its energy needs. Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia will meet in the United States on 6 November in attendance of representatives of the U.S. administration to break the deadlock in the ongoing negotiations regarding the Renaissance Dam. Now, in the face of a curfew, anti-government protesters risk their lives by taking to the streets in Iraq. We'll unpack this story and more after the break. Welcome back. Thousands of people in Iraq have continued to defy the curfew in Baghdad, taking back to the street for the sixth day in a row to protest against the government. Protesters have erected barricades and a bridge leading to the capital's fortified green zone as security forces continue to lob their tear gas canisters towards them. On Tuesday night in Karbala, security forces opened fire on protesters with reports stating that at least 18 people were killed. Lebanese security forces managed to open a number of blocked roads after 13 days consecutive of demonstrations. On Wednesday, troops cleared one major route north of Beirut, removing tents which had been blocking the traffic. This comes one day after the Prime Minister handed in his resignation as protesters have vowed to remain on the streets until more authorities resign. Our correspondent in Beirut, Wafika Ibrahim, has the details. We're at the main square in downtown Beirut. Behind us is the seat of the presidency and of the council of ministers. We're surrounded by people who have been on the streets for close to two weeks, who have been on strike, blocking roads, and calling for ministerial change and the overthrow of the government due to its neoliberal policies. On Tuesday, the Prime Minister presented his resignation in writing to the President of the Republic. His exit is considered a sure thing and the government is now in power in name only. The country has entered a phase of immense uncertainty. And while the youth feel they have achieved something great, historically, the appointment of a new leader in this country is subject to the will of several countries that have political interests within Lebanon. We have to see what the United States wants, what France wants, what Iran wants, what Saudi Arabia wants, what the UAA wants. A new prime minister needs to be approved by all these forces, and as such, they need to come up with a compromise. But we can say that there is a new force in the country and a new political outlook for the future. Shifting gears now. The UK is heading for yet another election after Prime Minister Boris Johnson won Parliament's approval for polls to be held on December 12th. This in a legislative bid to fast-track the Brexit agreement. Despite a number of hurdles, Johnson's wish for December 12th elections was granted after MPs voted in favour of it by 438 to 20. The bill now goes to the House of Lords, where it isn't expected to encounter any significant opposition, meaning it could become law by the end of the week. Are left with no choice but to go to the country to break free from this impasse and to allow us all to submit as we must in all humility to the judgment of the electorate and to allow us to make our case and above all to allow a new and revitalized parliament with a new mandate to deliver on the will of the people and get Brexit done because that new parliament in just a few weeks' time, we'll have before it a great new deal with the EU. 
Relatives of the victims of the March 10th Ethiopian Airlines plane crash have rejected an apology by Boeing Chief Executive Dallas Muellenberg. They said the apology was not sincere, but a public relations exercise to salvage the reputation of the company. They accused Boeing of not taking full responsibility for the faulty software no, that caused no, no the deadly crash. On really Tuesday, while appearing before U.S. lawmakers, Muellenberg offered an apology um, to the victims of ill-fated Flight 302, which crashed two minutes after taking it's off fine. from Addis Ababa, which, killing all 157 yeah, so, people I mean, on board. I don't care for Mr. Muhlenberg's remorse. I don't know what he feels inside. I get my solace from my friends and my family, not from the people who caused the death of my sister uh, and the other 346 people. Um, I thought that he had his talking points that he went through with his lawyers beforehand and he stuck to them fairly well. Um, there were a couple of admissions, especially by the chief engineer, um, of mistakes that they'd made, um, of the pilot response time of three seconds that they'd assumed that was an error. That brings us to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusrouenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.